Hello, Scott. Morning, mate. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good, actually. But give me one sec. I'm just going to find where I saved your list of. Uh, oh, I know where I saved it. Your mm -hmm. list of topics for discussion, which yeah. are interesting, actually. Yeah. Uh, do, do you don't mind if I record as well for my records? No, no, of course. Um, they. I'm recording it so I can send it to you easily yeah. enough. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just record on my on my end as well. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So. Um, oh, it says I need to request recording permission from you, but okay. I mean, whatever. How do you do that? I don't know. When I when I hit record, it tells me that I need to request recording permission from the meeting host. So um, okay. let me see if I can give you that. Manage participants more. Allow record. There we go. Thank you. All right. So to, to people who are watching this when it's maybe recorded, uh, this is Evgeny, who's a uh, uh, um, extremely bright guy and a developer. Um, who, and we're going to talk today about some uh, statistical concepts because he is a proper statistician and not a uh, broken down ex con like me. And he can hopefully bring some statistical rigor to these, uh, uh, to what we're doing here. So cool. he's got a list of stuff that he wants to discuss. And uh, so, so but before we go there, actually, can we just do one thing before, before we start with the discussion topic? Can we uh, look at um, the Euro USD uh, uh, baseline that you linked to me last week and just look at the very first just look at the very first um, setup. Um, so may, maybe you can help me understand it. That's sure. Because I, I, I was pretty confused about it. Okay. No Google Sheets. Okay, the first setup on the list, right? Yes. I hope I haven't made a mistake. That'll be embarrassing. Okay, it was down to. Point two pips. Let me open up the. Uh, so, so the one on. Uh, it I'll, looks like. I'll, I'll just share it. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that'd be great. Okay. Um, yes. So, so the reason I'm confused is it looks like the bar that's highlighted is actually just made a new high. So, yeah, that, that's a mistake. Shit. All right. So, um, so when I make a manual mistake, here's what I do. Okay is so the way that we try and eliminate mistakes is every day I do a review with Daniel. I go through my stuff mm -hmm. and neither of us have picked up the very first one by picks. So, so one above, FX template, and that is 10 to the eighth, 19. Okay, this has to be deleted. All right. But immediately it breaks the high. Um, and that was actually a uh, 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 a minus point seven six R. So the net effect on that uh, oh, sorry, point seven six. And, and, and sort of just to clarify. Um, when you entered the trade, did you enter it on the big on the big black bar that that comes in like a one, two, three, four bars later? Is, is that the point? Uh, yes, I see. So so basically, you mark where. So, but, but then but then aren't you supposed to lift the entry points in, in into the higher lows? Okay, so. When we implement a system, we start off with just recognizing the setups. And okay. then we go from that to paper trading, which is where I'm going to this week, which is yeah, yeah, the, yeah. so from that to doing it in real time, which is what I've been doing it in the last couple of weeks. And mm -hmm. then from doing it in real time to doing it with the order entry. And then from doing it with the order entry to doing it for like a few bucks a trade. And then we gradually yeah. ramp up like that. So what have I done there? Uh, it depends on... It depends if the there's an immediate break of that uh, uh, one two three fourth from the fourth from the high bar immediate break of that the very next bar 
and it depends if the low of the setup bar was 802. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So the very so next bar basically so it, breaks it, the low. It okay. depends on whether or not, it depends on the rounding. So I round down to the nearest half pip. So 802 rounds down to, to 800. So it, it looks like it's got to fill the next bar. But if I it see. did not get a fill, you would keep adjusting it up for the, uh, as the higher lows happen. I see. And so j just to clarify, the, the point that you mark is, um, is the price at which the, the trade is filled? Um, that's, the, that's the setup bar. If the setup bar is, uh, is not filled, you're not marking the trade. So if the setup bar is not filled, you, you, might, uh, you might make a new, a new screen capture with a setup bar a couple later. Okay, and, great. And then, if, and then if that one's filled. Great. So, okay, that makes sense. So yes. in real time, it becomes drastically more complicated because you have to uh, uh, do a lot of stuff that doesn't end up in the in the final spreadsheet, right? Like mm -hmm. you just can't assume that stuff is gonna. So you're always doing stuff. You know, it's not like oh, I made four screen captures in an eight-hour day. It's like mm -hmm. you're making fifty and discarding forty-six of them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Okay. Cool. Uh, that's uh, that's good for that little um, excursion. All right. So, so um, you've talked about in, uh, predicting. When, when we say predicting, it doesn't mean getting something 100% correct. Now, uh, in, terms of, in, in terms of price action, we're not really predicting. What we're doing is observing what is happening now. So, mm -hmm. so I can't say, I can say with certainty um, the market is going up now. And in context, the market is going up now after, after it's made an extreme low, mm -hmm. probably has an implication for price action that you can measure. But I can't predict with any certainty that's going to happen. What I, um, well, well, well so, so here, here comes the, the little right. bit of a con conflict. And, and, and this, is, this is more than anything, ju just a question of semantics. And I just want to, I just want to make sure we're talking almost about it. Almost certainly my semantics are wrong. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so it, like it, in some sense, the, the, way, the way I think about things is that if you do have a setup that you can show to have positive expectancy, you can, you can call that predicting. <laughs> so, okay, okay, okay. So yeah, yeah, we're on the, we're on the, we're on the same page now. Okay. Um, the vast majority of these setups that I'm showing you, they, you know, if I show them in the right context and cherry pick the examples, they look like white man magic, right? But, mm -hmm. the, but the truth is nothing of the sort. So the vast majority of the edge comes from, let me show you. Um, let me just share my screen again. Okay. Okay. So here we have a touch of the Bollinger, lower closes, high closes. This is the Australian dollar monthly chart. It was just mm -hmm. the thing that I had open on my screen because mm -hmm. um, I'm working at FX rates. Oh no, we've broken the high there. Okay, touch of, uh, uh, well actually this is another setup, a double top we call the fake out, a spike high, a bar with a lower high to the left and a lower high, a lower high preceding it and a lower high subsequent to it. The first bar to break that spike high yeah. It's set up in the opposite direction. We go short one tick below the bar low with one tick above the bar high. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems like that's an edge, but the vast majority of the edge comes from the fact that we've waited to go short before it breaks the bar low. So um, if you look at the foundation of where these work, um, most of it, without breaking the bar low, these are not good edges at all, and yeah. So, 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 so this kind of flows into into the second part of discussion about about what is actually an edge, and I, I think um, I think I think this is an extremely important um, point of discussion that is is very necessary if we if we are going to do any kind of any kind of rigorous testing. Okay, so an uh, an edge is something that you have. Uh, uh, how do I define it without tra running into semantic traps? You, 
you have a positive correlation of uh, you have a positive correlation of profit going forward after your entry conditions are met. So if you did a if you did a scatter plot uh, plotting the profit after one, after two, after three, after four bars, um, you would see initially a strong positive correlation at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So, so basically, that that's how that, that's how you define that's how you define what, what, what an edge is. And, so, and so basically, am I correct? And, and and keep in mind that I did exactly you know one year of university statistics, and I think it was in like nineteen ninety one or nineteen ninety two mm -hmm. or some shit like that. So it's like there's a lot of water under the bridge since then, and a lot of brain cells destroyed. So you, yeah. there's a difference. Please educate me because I'm probably wrong. You're probably wrong. Well, I mean, it's not so much um, that anybody's right or wrong. It's it's just a question almost of certainly, almost certainly it is right or wrong. It's it's just a question of defining what we mean by the words that we use. So please help help, help me clear that up. Yeah. So uh, I mean, um, so. Here's, like, I, I mean, to be honest, th th this is something I'm still kind of working towards uh, myself to, to have a reasonable definition of, of, what, of what an edge is. Like, like for example, w one of the things that I've um, kind of used in the past to do some testing, I call an edge is something that if you if you take um, like the standard deviation, it, it, yeah. So 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 if you if you have some kind of defined defined um, setup that you know you you can find repeatedly, and then and then you take um, the standard deviation over the past like ten bars, let's say, mm -hmm. then you have a higher probability of um, and you just do a one R trade uh, where the R is that standard deviation. And then, and then the edge is basically uh, like one of the ways I think about it is that an edge is if you have a higher probability of winning that trade than losing that. Trade. Okay, so you're so you're looking at recent standard deviation. Yeah. And and you have a higher probability of accepting that standard deviation rather than not. Oh, uh, like if you if you j just set a one R trade with a one R stop loss, so so you have a stop loss and and, and, and a one R. See, now there's a problem with that because when you test that, you're not testing your entry condition. You're testing the 1R, you're testing the stop loss, you're testing those three, those two things in, in together. Um, so yeah. so yeah. To, to, to make it a test of, of the edge in isolation, it, it really should be irres because any stop loss, by, and I'm jumping ahead because you talk about that, any stop loss by definition is inefficient, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, yeah. many... Um, many hedge fund systems, you know, many commercial systems for mean reversion don't use stop losses before because the rationale behind at all, because the rationale is if you were, if, if you were entering on a three sigma move, expecting mean reversion, and then, oh, fuck, you got four sigma, mm -hmm. wouldn't you be even more confident in mean reversion rather than less confident? Wouldn't you want to be doubling down on that trade rather than conceptually? That's... That's I mean, well, I mean, it, it, it obviously, depends on the obviously you go broke doing. Yeah. Obviously, you go broke eventually doing that, and you take tail risk. But yeah, that, yeah. but that, but you know, there's a significant um, professional, you know, um, contingent of mean reversion traders who don't use stop losses at all. And mm -hmm. in fact, stock based mean reversion traders don't use stop losses at all generally, um, mm -hmm. because the gap effect in stocks. Um, messes things around with, with, with stops, right? So mm -hmm. any stop loss by definition is, is inefficient. So if you're testing a yes. stop loss and an entry condition and an exit condition, you're testing the complex interaction between three things. And, and in my view, you need a lot more data to get a statistically significant quantity of evidence. And, and I don't even know how much is enough. Like mm -hmm. it's certainly in the thousands and thousands of trades, right? Like, uh, and I, I wouldn't even know how to begin calculating it. So, in, so in, in, in my view, what you have to do is take the entry condition by itself, irrespective of stop loss and irrespective of target, and go after one bar, were you in profit or loss? Okay. Uh, make a and the advantage of that is that for every trade that you measure, you're mm -hmm. generating a number, you're generating like 10 different data points, right? Yeah. So, but, but that, yeah, but then sort of the question is like, how many, how many bars do you go forward? 
Okay, um, that's a good question. And the, the answer, and the answer is you go forward the average, your best guess as to the average length of, of your trade. Oh, interesting. So, so, yes, so best, it doesn't have to be perfect because you know you're going to see if you spot it. If, if you plot a scatter plot, you're going to see. Uh, um, do I have a you know a, 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 like like scatter plot dots up and to the right? It's probably up and to the left and not here. But um, <laughs> you know, do you have a positive correlation? Do you have a negative correlation? Yeah. You know, after after entry, can or, or or does it look like just random dots? Like if it just looks like random dots, you're almost certainly not dealing with an edge. Very interesting. Okay, so 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 basically, um, like the way you characterize an edge is it's it's essentially a function of the entry condition, and uh, yes. that's yeah. Okay, great, cool. That, um, because without that, mm -hmm. you know, if we if if we're entering trades with stop losses and and targets, you can inter you can have completely nonsensical negative edge systems that produce a very plausible looking equity curve for quite a long time, like over a year. You can have, you know, if, if, if you put, um, let me, let me well, well, I mean, th th that also kind of depends on your resolution, whether you're looking at the, at the daily chart or, or the hourly or, or the two minutes. Okay, so, so check this out that someone sent to me a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. So this is um, blackjack um, number of hands. So this is a um, uh, hundred thousand hands of blackjack. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Four different series. Um, blackjack we know is a negative expectancy, mm -hmm. and yet you know for like ten thousand hands you get a winning streak on one of these or like 5,000 hands, you've got a winning streak, you know. In here, you've got a, you know, big, you know, it, this is entirely normal. And and the total return is nothing. But you know what I mean? Like, like sure, it, sure. And and the, the problem for us as traders is that you are, your brain is a pattern matching machine, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, like your, we evolved because our brain sees patterns of things like you're like you're some sort of caveman you're starving to death you're almost out of food you don't like you don't like add up the probabilities of stuff like a statistician you just mm -hmm. make your best guess and and you know oh look over there it looks like there might be you know over that next hill there might be some food or you know you you're matching patterns and 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 making your best guess on imperfect mm -hmm. information you know mm -hmm. it's why people still believe in astrology and Sure, sure, sure. Homeopathy and all kinds of nonsense because we see patterns where none exist. So, sure. and, and so my experience is that I'm always seeing, I always have to assume that what I'm seeing is nonsense. And what I believe, and many times I've found that things that I was sure were an edge, sadly were not. Interesting. Um, um, sadly were not. Like, mm -hmm. like many times, many times. How, how, how do uh, you, well, how does that process usually go of, of you basically figure, like thinking that something is an edge and that they okay, that so figured it, out that it, it wasn't? This went when I still thought that back tests were the be all and end all. Okay. Uh, and so, and this, and this still happened when my systems were relatively more complicated than they were today. So the okay. more rules you have in a system, the more complicated your system is. The more market mm -hmm. regime stuff, the more this, the more that, the more the, the more rules, the more complex interaction of those rules you get. So the more luck is involved. So the yeah. more back testing you need to be sure. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and the, you just need too much, and you just get stuck in one of those short runs. Oh, it works great, and then uh, no, it doesn't. Um, so there's two ways that you uh, that you counter that. The first is what I talked about, which is what. Uh, doing scatter plots, which is the standard quant method in all the, you know, the quant finance courses. And all, this is, you know, this is not my idea. This is just something sure. that's for people smarter than me. Sure. This, is the, this is the standard way now. Build a scatter plot first. Mm -hmm. Once you've got a, um, um, once you've got a decent scatter plot, you know, then you can do the back test. Yeah. Interesting. Uh... There's a couple of hacks you can do to make to to minimize the effect of Garbage in, uh, of bullshitting yourself, right? So, so, so uh, one of the things that um, 
we, uh, I mean, certainly like quant use, and it's very common in machine learning, is, is to basically have a, have a holdout data set. Is, is to basically, yeah, that's what I was like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you have a, uh, uh, um, I forget the term, you sequester off some of your data, and yeah. you don't get it at all, and then exactly. you run the shit over that to see. Exactly. Yeah, 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 cool. Okay. Okay. So, 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 but, but that, that's, 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 that's one method. Mm -hmm. um, other things you can do to minimize the odds, which are always significant of you bullshitting yourself. You yeah. can test it on multiple time frames. Mm -hmm. um, even though, and what you should see is more noise and less signal as you get down to low time frames, and and yeah. but you sh but you should see up to a certain point. You should see not. It works on this time frame, but not on any of the others. It should be, not all time frames are created equal, but it, yeah. you should see it one number in a forest of good numbers. You, mm -hmm. it, it should work if it's a system that should work on all time on all markets, like unless there's some fundamental reason why it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and an example of that would be that the stock markets behave very differently than the FX markets on the short side, okay. um, because shorting is a very different thing than going long in stocks. Yeah. Um, so unless there's some reason, huge red flag, oh, it works on gold. It's a gold system, but it doesn't work on bonds. Like, mm -hmm. the fuck it doesn't. Like, mm -hmm. you've, got a, uh, you've got a highly optimized system, and highly optimized systems are by definition fragile, right? Yeah. So, so, highly op so there's a couple of, it's okay to trade highly optimized systems, but what you need is a very heavy regime of checking other results still within normal parameters and either dynamically decreasing position size as they as it falls out of regime or cutting them off beyond a certain point yeah so uh, and, or um what some of the quant funds do is they run a whole portfolio of you know 50 different of these spurious you know data mined edges and, yeah. and they'll be cutting off, they're only trading the top five or they're, yeah. they're trading them according to the, to how well they did most recently. You know, if yeah. this said is all of a sudden killing it, wow, it gets more capital allocation. If yeah. this said just falling out of favor, perfectly valid yeah, way that, to approach that problem, right? Yeah, that, that's basically what what Wolf Font did where, where it worked. Like uh, the, all, all their researchers submitted like alphas, so-called, and, and then- And, 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 then they and then their portfolio managers would optimize them into strategies and then, they they actually didn't even know like what the alphas were. They just like took statistics on them. Okay, and so I mean, I mean, that's an approach. Mm -hmm. It's an approach personally beyond my skill set. Yeah, um, yeah, it yeah. has it has a downside. The downside is that um, you think that you've got these twenty independent alphas, mm -hmm. but but chances are they're all taking the same fucking tail risk. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that makes sense. Chances are 2008 hits, market regime changes, and, and it's not like, oh, we've got a different five working out of the 50. It's like none of them work all of a sudden. Yeah. So, the, so, so they take, uh, that, in my view, that approach takes hidden tail risk. Um, lots of things that take hidden tail risk. That's, yeah. not a, that's not a unique situation in system building by any means. Cool. Makes sense. Um, okay. Cool. Next. Yeah, I, I, th I think that, that's very useful. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll think about that. Yeah. See what, what I have more to say, um, and then hopefully we can get a deeper discussion going on about that. Okay, yeah. so um, so you say that no system works a hundred percent of the time; it's dependent on market regime. However, in principle, there's nothing stopping us from having a meta system that substitutes a different system based on different market regimes. It seems, at least in theory, it seems that this meta system would have the desired expectancy hundred percent of the time. Okay, this is the holy grail. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, um. This was what I was originally trying to do in like 2012. And I tested a bunch of different market regime stuff. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the stuff that I tested was mostly based on the work of a guy called Ken Long, uh, who developed some excellent market regime stats called stretch stat and slope stat and vol stat. So yeah, uh, I, I, look, I looked at that in the, in the, in the um, system building course. By the way, great stuff. Um, very, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, I tested that and I tested a bunch of other stuff and, and uh, everything that I could find. And mm -hmm. uh, the bottom line was it made my system so complicated, they were by definition fragile, so I never had enough back testing to get a statistically significant result. Now, mm -hmm. 
to a certain extent, the Holy Grail system is an attempt. There's two, you've, got two, you've got two ways of solving this problem, right? Yeah. Way number one is we're developing a market classification regime, either through, some, either through some simple indicator or through some complicated machine learning thing. You know, call it a black box that tells you, are we trending, are we sideways, or are we down? Yeah. And, and, yeah. We, and, and what volatility, you know, in theory, we should be able to, you know, what volatility regime are we in? It's not that complicated. Mm -hmm. Are we trending? You know, there's a number of ways to approach that. Um, mm -hmm. And in theory, you should be able to slot in your best performing thing on the on the other end and, and get it out. In, yeah. in reality, that extra level of complexity means a huge level of luck, which mm -hmm. means the purpose of the, the purpose of back testing is so that you know what within regular parameters, what your drawdowns are going to be like. And uh, uh, my experience is that your drawdowns are always when you do that, just way higher than you would ever expect. And and my best guess as to why the the back tests and the and the real money were not matching up, um, my best guess was it was just too fragile, too complicated. I see. But um, but I mean, not sure about that. Now, yeah. Now, but, sorry. So, no, sorry. Um, just, just to follow up. Um. What when you uh, like you you mentioned in the system building masterclass that when the when the market regimes change, like some systems stop working, and that that maybe. You have to substitute in other systems. So, oh. so then my, my follow-up question is then: is, is this sort, is this manual process sort of not the exact same thing, or, or are you just saying that kind of manually you're able to do that a lot better than than automatic? My experience, um, not being someone with you know, yeah, not being not being a real expert, I'm a guy who figured out as much as I could mm -hmm. sitting on my computer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and my formal education was a long time ago yeah. um, and not very complete. Um, mm -hmm. So my experience is I tried that a lot of different ways and I tried it with, with several automated systems and I got very, very unsatisfying results. I see. Um, that was, so there's a couple of approaches you could take that are probably better than that. If it's rather than trying to get it right every time, it's probably easier to, on any given system, to know what it doesn't work on. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, um, it's it hardly any systems at all work in low volatility sideways markets simply because they're going up and down in very small yeah. ranges. Like you're going long here, short here, or mm -hmm. if you're doing trend following, you're getting stopped out all the time. Like it's mm -hmm. just a shitty thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you can exclude the worst of the worst offenders. That's yeah. a significant benefit too. That's another approach rather than trying to, to slot it in perfectly every time. Now, the other approach, which we've taken with the Holy Grail system, is you can make market regime selection implicit in the system rules. So yeah. you, can, you can make it so it's very difficult to take a trend following setup when the market is, in, is going sideways. Yeah. And that's, yeah. It, for me, that's a more satisfying approach mm -hmm. um, because I'm not coming at it from a massive data um, perspective. Yeah, but, but I mean, uh, from my perspective, it's, it seems like that's the, the Holy Grail system is essentially kind of doing what I suggest. Like, like essentially you're saying that, you know, once you have that um, um, decreasing decreasing ATR. Um, well, well, that's trying to take out the work end because, yeah. if, you know, if, um, let me just pull up some price action, I'll show you what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So let's pick, say, um, USD. And let's pull it down in the way. And let's make it like two minutes or whatever. Okay, so um, fairly, 
you know, fairly typical thing, we have a volatility spike and then the trend keeps going, but it keeps going with decreasing volatility mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of the normal situation. So this is a really abnormal situation, this, mm -hmm. this section from here to here. Now, mm -hmm. if we were to take um, retest variation cells off the Bollinger, you have one here, didn't work, didn't make yeah. one up. You have one here, didn't work, didn't make one up. You have mm -hmm. one here, didn't work, didn't make one up. So you've got, you know, you know, it's normal to have three or four consecutive losing trades. And, you know, we've got the same situation here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so what you so what I'm trying to do is, is, is not match market regime as much as remove the worst of the worst offenders. I see. Okay. Um, Makes sense. So, so when I'm, the goals of this system were focused on you know, you've obviously, if you've had a bit of a look at it, you see that, that you know, there's plenty of uh, five and six hour winners around. Why don't I try and go for some of those? But I wasn't focused on that. What I want is low drawdowns. And if you're yeah, going to be, if you're going to be focused on low drawdowns, um, the primary thing was removing the, the times when you get five, six losing trades in a row, which, mm -hmm. yeah, from a per, which from a personal perspective, you sit down at the computer, you, you, ah, right, let's get after it. Eight yeah. hours later, you've had six losing trades. It's like, mm -hmm. might be okay in an automated system, but if you're do, if you're hitting the buttons yourself, it's just heartbreaking. Absolutely, and uh, and, and cer certainly if you're able to get that out, that that's that's great. Like that that's that's a uh, yeah, but I'm not it, a, clear, it, a clear improvement. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah so yeah, in, um, that's what I was that's what I was doing there. So. I have friends who are, are proper quants who are um, going down the market uh, market classification route, market regime mm -hmm. uh, route. And the best approach that I've seen from them is to develop a model of the, they're, they're doing volatility, volatility edges on VXY and things like that. So they're, mm -hmm. so they're for, the, for the VIX products. So they're developing a model of the way the VIX should behave and when the model gets out of shape, they're trading mean reversion to the model, not mean reversion to price. They're yes. saying, okay, eventually this aberration in the way the market is behaving will go back to markets behaving normally. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a reasonable assumption, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, so the, and so the way they do that is by um, chopping off everything over two standard deviations to one side and two standard deviations to the other other side, they're chopping off, assuming it was two standard deviations because outliers are uh, um, uh, distorting their data and they're, and they're building a model and, and, you know, is our model in line with the, with the current model and using all kinds of machine learning cool. to, to grade their trades and grading their trades from you know, to, to whatever. That's a neat mm -hmm. approach beyond my skills. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right. I, I think we we right. went, over, went over that pretty well. All right. Yeah. After, yeah. After that, I just uh, listed my market beliefs in line with that. All <laughs> right. Your, um, your beliefs about markets. Um, distribution of price action is okay. So now, before we get into this, let's talk about um, what beliefs are for, and 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 what they're not for. So it's extremely difficult to trade a system that goes in some way contrary to your market beliefs. Like at, you, you're kind of subconsciously hoping it fails, and it introduces this weird cognitive dissonance. And you know, I've I, I've tried to trade systems that were um, that were contrary to my market beliefs. Um, that may have been an edge, but I just hated it. And I was secretly hoping that I'd lose money all the time. It was like it's just really. Fuck. Interesting. Yeah. It's weird. So some of your beliefs might be helpful and some of them might be true, but unhelpful. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, lots of people believe in spurious prediction regimes, you know, like Ann Engels and Elliott Wave and things like mm -hmm. that. And, you know, a large amount of that is just seeing patterns where there are none. Mm -hmm. But these sorts of beliefs are unhelpful. Yeah. You know, there's, then there's plenty of beliefs that are you know, I believe someone's done a big statistical thing about sunspots and, mm -hmm. and sunspot effect. Even if it's real, it's a fucking unhelpful belief to have, right? Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sorry, that shit is just going to lead you to madness. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
All right, so you believe that the distribution of price action is not stationary, market regimes change. Yeah, absolutely. And market regimes have always changed. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that any trading concept is profitable unless I have sufficient statistical evidence. In other words, you're a reality-based individual sets mm -hmm. you aside from the, um, from the large majority of humanity. But you know, in and of itself, that's not a bad thing to mm -hmm. believe in objective truth and reality rather than just made up bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, the most important property of a setup is expected value. Yes, if your expectation is negative, you shouldn't trade though. Uh, the second most important thing is win rate. Having a positive EV because of a rare large winner is not desirable. Okay, now, why is it not desirable? Why is it not desirable? Because you're going to have large drawdowns. Okay, and uh, let me pull up an equity curve for you. Mm -hmm. Take me a sec to find it. All right, let me show this. Okay, I know this system very well. Mm -hmm. I know the rules of the system. Um, from 1970, thousand bucks in 1970, a million um, substantially outperforming the S and P. Mm -hmm. Thirteen drawdowns greater than 25 percent. Mm -hmm. Recovers every time like a champ. Mm -hmm. Still terrible. On a risk-adjusted basis, it is. This is like a point. Six uh, sharp ratio system. Yeah, so I I, I I would definitely not be comfortable trading this. Okay, uh, but it is an edge, and why is it an edge? It's an edge because the very act of taking a twenty five percent winning trade after you've had fifteen consecutive losing trades is an emotionally crippling thing, right? Mm -hmm. The edge comes from doing the difficult thing. Do you know anyone who had the nuts to go long stocks in 2009? Mm. I don't. I never did. I was trading. I didn't. No. I thought, fuck, it's going to go another leg down for sure. <laughs> Do you know anyone who had the guts to go short when it was all looking great in 2008? I didn't. I got my ass handed to me. You know, to do the difficult thing, the emotionally difficult thing, in the long run will have a positive return. Um, for example, Warren Buffett bought, um, uh, bought Goldman, put a, a billion dollars into Goldman just after Lehman Day. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, that was a massive balls move. Mm -hmm. You know, the, and, and that, that ability to do the emotionally difficult thing, there is an edge in that long term. It's just not a... Uh, um, yeah, but I mean, like sixty-three percent drawdown. I, 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 I definitely wouldn't be able to like trade that. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. Let me show. <laughs> let me show you something else interesting, which you, you, you know. like. I, I may as well tra trade Bitcoin now for for my whole money. <laughs> no. Okay, so uh, we're still sharing. Okay, so, so this is a fund I know called Mulvaney. It's their, their actual returns. Mm -hmm. um, uh, these type, of, these type of, of, of systems, if you look at when they perform, they did shit in 1999 when it was going good, did 24% in 2000. Mm -hmm. 2007, when everything was roaring, this is almost exactly the same as done, by the way. They did down 23, did 108% in 2008. Yeah. In 2012, where we had a little kerfuffle, and 2004, uh, 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 2012, when everything was going great, did, did good. And then 43 and 67 mm -hmm. uh, in there. So these systems and, and like this done system, these are uh, extremely uncorrelated with the market as a, as a whole. 
So there is some value to something that smashes it out of the park when it, when everything else is going bad. Yeah. You know, like these these systems are not without their value at all. They um, um, they if you if if you combine something like this with other income streams on a volatility weighted basis, which is uh, um, uh, Ray Dalio's theory, you get a much better risk, risk adjusted return. If you, if you took the S&P and this volatility weighted, so this would be a smaller position, and you mm -hmm. took some Bitcoin volatility weighted, so that would be a smaller position, mm -hmm. and you got, and you got, you know, seven or eight other things, um, you're getting one of the free lunches, in, one of the only free lunches in finance is diversification, right? Yeah, th that I definitely agree with. But 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 the but the system on its own, like I probably wouldn't trade. You wouldn't trade that. Okay, I get j it. J j just on its own, like I it, what what once you combine it with other things, it, it's sort of no no longer a standalone system. It's no longer a standalone. System. Okay, so the the win rate is as a general rule, most of the professional traders that I've known have win rates around or just below fifty percent. Now yeah, that's fine. Yeah. The manual traders, and the reason for that is if your win rate is high, uh, like the Holy Grail system, your default expectation can be to have a winner. Um, mm -hmm. So it can hit you in the fields when you have a loser or mm -hmm. a string of losers. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, that's very common for our students is is they get three losing trades in a row, which is not an unusual thing. Like happens yeah. all the time, mm -hmm. and then they and they whining like little bitches. Like this shouldn't happen. <laughs> Stand, like it shouldn't happen the odds of this are nothing um, mm -hmm. the system's broken like it's not because your wins and your your wins and your losers cluster um mm -hmm. the unsatisfying thing about trading system returns is that they're not normally distributed whatever you, you know you might be at a 60 65 percent win rate but all those losers are going to come together and you're going to have periods where it's 80 and the periods where it's 40 you know what i mean mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. yeah um, sure okay the third most important thing is the frequency of the setup, which is very interesting. Um, I call this expect, uh, 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 I use a made up word, expectancy times opportunity is expectunity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've got an expectancy of 0 0.2, you're risking a thousand bucks a trade mm -hmm. and, you know, times how many trades you have, it's, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, um, okay. Now, commission adjustment idea, any, any stop loss by, by definition is inefficient, by definition. If it hits your stop, so if you imagine, sometimes it hits your stop loss and that's a good idea, you wanna be out of that trade. Mm -hmm. Some other times it hits your stop loss, it's like, oh fuck, and then the trade worked after it stopped me out. Mm -hmm. Anytime it does that, you've got a bad result, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. By definition. So sure. there's a couple of ways that um, uh, institutional traders mitigate that and one of them is that you, you can use closing basis stops. You only exit if you get a close below where your stop loss level is rather than a hard stop. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, there's another common thing to use what uh, a hedge fund buddy of mine calls um, the French stop loss, which he calls mm -hmm. it, he's a Frenchman, he calls it, he means it's to be fashionably late to the stop loss. So they have a Hail Mary stop loss, a couple of standard deviations below, like, so he doesn't have to explain to his, to his manager why he just took a massive loss, and then and then overall his stop losses aren't in, and he exits if it closes below rather than mm -hmm. rather than touches a cent level. Yeah, but but sort of that, that that's not that's not my main point. So so my main point is that um, so if you in the in the holy grail system, mm -hmm. so if if you have a high and tight setup and um, your the your R value in terms of in terms of pips is very small. Like let's say let's say one pip or even like 0. 0.7 pips. In that case, um, the amount you're paying in commission relative. Oh, I mean, oh okay, okay, okay. Now, okay, we're talking about a totally different thing. All right. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so this is a very yeah. interesting topic. So the amount you're paying for commission in that rate in in that situation would be in the equivalent of an expectancy of 0. 0.3 R, which is an uh, exactly. Uh, which is a, a, an impediment to overcome. Exactly. So here's, here's what we do to to maneuver around that, which has some uh, has some happy effects. Mm -hmm. We size the position on a minimum viable. We work out what, for the pair that you're trading. What is the minimum that you're willing to give away? And so, that, sorry, the maximum that you're willing to give away. 
And in my view, the maximum that you should be giving away in comms is about 0.1 expectancy. Any more than that, and you're into the like, you're making your broken money and you're not making Yeah, money. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. And even 0.1 is really stretching, right? I would like yeah. to keep it to low. Exactly. So I would like to keep it to about half that. Well, let's say worst case scenario, 0.1. Yeah. So you work, so you work out what your... Uh, um, do you want me to show, run through the maths now or, or you just want to run the theory? Uh, I mean, if you, if you want to continue, uh, I'll, I'll like... Okay, let me show you the maths. Sure. Um, where is my... Okay, let's say you're risking three pips, mm -hmm. which is about the minimum that things are viable for. Like I wouldn't trade any less than three. Mm -hmm. um, your size of the size of your trade is three hundred thirty-three thousand, so three um, three mm -hmm. mini contracts. Mm -hmm. You've got two legs of that contract, so you you're paying comms both in and both out. Yeah. Uh, on interactive brokers, for example, the uh, um, the the worst commission rate they have is is 0.2 of a basis point, and the best is, yeah. is mm -hmm. 0.8 of a uh, yeah. 0.08 of a basis point. Mm -hmm. So your comms max on that would be 0.13. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and your worst is, and if you're on a, a best case, it's 0.05. Now, mm -hmm. because of these position sizes, 666,000, your uh, sorry, 333,000, your Sorry, it's six hundred sixty-six thousand. Your best commission structure kicks in at five million per month, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. When wait, wait, oh, so, so, these are for hundred dollar risk. These are for hundred dollar risk trades, by the way. So, so risking a hundred dollars, which is which is hardly anything, is the minimum that anyone's going to trade for a living. So, is it not uh, on the interactive broker subsidies? I think it's five billion per month. Is it? Yeah. So, okay. so, so, so that, that's what I like. I. I, I I responded to, yeah. I, I res I'm wrong. Let me check. Yeah, I responded to your email when you when you said it's five million um, per month, um, but I'm pretty sure it's five billion per month. Five billion. Well, that would make more sense. Let me let me just check, and then we'll look at how many trades it is. Mm -hmm. Five million. Oh, that is a lot of trades. Oh, you are right. It is five billion. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at uh, so how many is one billion? You're absolutely correct, and I'm wrong. So fifteen hundred trades. That's still more than anyone's going to do. So okay. So we're going to be on. So we're going to be on this. Yeah. So exactly. you're absolutely correct. So here, if we look at the pips at risk. Mm -hmm. In fact, let's get an average. So average pips at risk is 3.66. Yep. Somewhere, somewhere around Somewhere around there, so the average average comms is about 0 0.14. Mm -hmm. So the effect of that pretty substantial, mm -hmm. pretty substantial. So, not, so not quite a deal, not quite a deal breaker. Yeah. So listen to sort of um, how, how I think is is the correct way to deal with this. Um, so the the commission should factor. Into into what determines um, how much your R value is. So it's not so because the, how are you doing it right now? Right now your right now your R value is essentially the equal to the amount that you would um, your basically risk the amount that if you stopped out and you lose that much that's your R value. Right? I, I, no 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 I'm doing I'm doing it slightly different. So if the trade is if let's say you're risking let's say you're risking one point one pick right. Okay. When you say you're risking one pip, what does that mean? It means you're, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's say that's one pip. 
You size the trade according to three pips, but you still place your stop loss at one point. You don't use that arbitrary three pip stop value. So what, so what it has the effect of is that some of your trades, are, some of your losing trades are very small. So you have 0.6 R losing trades instead of one R losing trades. So check out the, so check out the effect. I see. Okay. So, so check this out. Okay. So, so you still call the three pip your R, but then you just. Correct. And what this does is here, you can see that the, whoa, I've broken something here. How have I broken my equity? I've broken my equity curve anyway. So, but the average loss is minus 0.88. Mm -hmm. uh, I know what I did. I deleted the top row and I killed my equity curve. <laughs> I'll fix it later. So, but anyway, it, it, but by reducing out, by reducing your average loss from one R down to 0.88 R, that's adding 0.12 expectancy to. Yeah. If you think, it, well, it's not quite adding 1.12, that's a, um, but it's adding substantially to the expectancy of the system, which, which is an additional boost over and uh, over and on top on, on top of. It's an it's an additional gain it, because you know there's two, there's 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 two ways to make your system improve. One is to make your winners bigger on average, yeah. and the other is to make your losers smaller on average. So can can, can you go into how? you select uh, how much the R value is again then? Because uh, an example, an example of my Yeah, the, the one I thought of. Okay. Um, minimal viable R, pick any one. Okay, this trade here, long sure. above here, stop loss here. Sure. Okay, the long you can see is one nine uh, is ninety one, and the stop would be eighty nine. Mm -hmm. Probably eighty nine and a half. No, probably mm -hmm. eighty nine, which is yeah. here. And so that's uh, uh, that's two pips, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the target remains 1.1 R on the three pip, which is 3.3 pips, which is 91. So, okay, so basically what you're saying is that if your distance to stop loss is less than three pips, then your R is automatically three pips. Correct. Now, now check it out here. We had um, entry, it did not achieve the target here because yeah. the target was 91 plus, 3.3 3 and a half, which is the nearest round up from 3.3, .3, which is just here. So it's just missed the target, come out, stopped us out. So the loss here is not one R, but the loss here is minus 0.83. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I definitely understand that. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll write down in formulas um, the, the way I kind of think is the, is the more correct way to do it and, and I'll share it with you I'm, later. I'm totally open to, I'm, yeah. th this is the, the best thing that we've come up with and you know, it's early days for the system. If we can find, if we can find yeah. something better, poof, I'm all over. Yeah, yeah. It, it, like, like es essentially the way I think w w it would make sense is for, for your R value, it should be your stop, your distance to stop plus whatever the commission is. And then your profit, that's, that's not a bad idea. Okay. Yeah, and, they, and, and, and then from the profit, you have to subtract the commission, like in, um, in, um, in the reverse. So, so basically, that, that, that automatically builds in the commission into, into your trade. I'd like to run some numbers on that. That shouldn't be too difficult to do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. give me, can you give me a day or two and then, and then can we reconvene? And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a really that's good idea, man. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. that's worth testing. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So um, we only got halfway through the list, but um, we can do this again in a couple of days if you like. Or yeah, um, absolutely. So we can. I, I, think um, is, I think this is a really, really productive discussion. And, and, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. So 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 let's. Uh, I'll, I'll schedule maybe on Wednesday. 
or or maybe Thursday. I, I we're, we're like one day off, so I'm not really sure what day we're talking about. Yeah, your toilet flush in the wrong direction and shit. Yeah, like right now, I'm right now I'm, I'm it's my Sunday for Monday. So. Okay, yeah, it's Monday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, man. I um, really enjoyed the discussion. Um, excellent stuff, and and yeah, enjoying work. Okay. okay, great. Yeah, great. I'll uh, I'll speak to you. I'll I'll schedule another meeting in a few days, and we can we can be. Thanks. Take care, man. Bye bye. Uh,